And now, it's time for King Cool's Top 10 Best and Worst Films of 2022. Before we begin, here are the honorable mentions, because saying honorable mentions is easier than figuring out the plural for runner-up. Alright, these are runner-ups, so no black t-shirt this time. Um, and they're not runner-ups as far as, like, nearly the best or nearly the worst. They're just movies I want to talk about that didn't make either list. Okay, this one is actually a runner-up for the best list. This is just about one of the best ideas for a comedy I've seen in the last ten years, uh, where Nicolas Cage plays a slightly less successful version of himself, who ends up um, doing a celebrity appearance at the uh, villa of a vicious uh, South American drug dealer who idolizes him. The movie starts to lose steam somewhere in the third act, but nevertheless, Nick Cage, Pedro Pascal, and Lily Moshin are all doing absolutely great work here. This movie is a lot of fun. If it had crested that hill and made it to the end intact, I probably would have found a space for it on the top ten. If the list was the hardest I laughed in the first 15 minutes of a movie, this would do it. Uh, an arrogant, stuffy New York podcaster gets a mysterious call that someone he used to know back in Texas has died, and he goes down there to see what's going on, and eventually gets uh, wrapped up in the true crime intrigue of it all, and starts making a podcast about the woman's disappearance. But what starts as a horrifying, awkward farce eventually just becomes kind of a normal crime mystery style movie, although comedy skewed. I don't really like the second act downbeat where, you know, they accuse the New York wimpy liberal of not really caring about their daughter, even though these rednecks have lied about the conditions that led to her death or disappearance. So, yeah, those things aren't exactly equal. Yes, he's an awful snob, but I'll take him over these goddamn rednecks any day of the week. To hell with them for spitting at the one person who might have brought justice to their door. It's kind of similar to the ending of um, Jurassic World Dominion, which, look, like, is still bad, but it's actually the best of the three, so that's not on the worst list either. But at the end of Jurassic World Dominion, there's a part where they say, uh, if we're going to survive, we need to learn to coexist. No, maybe we don't need to learn to coexist with brainless monsters that commit violence at the drop of a hat. Maybe they need to learn to coexist with civilization. And if they can't do that, maybe they should go away! Do you remember The Missing Link, the, the like a stop motion film that they did? Which is actually their least successful film to date. It was also the only Laika film to not have a child protagonist. The protagonists were like an adult adventurer, a guy who could easily be a villain in, in another movie. It'd be like making Christopher Columbus a, a hero in a movie now. An adult woman and the Yeti, who himself is childlike in demeanor, but is still also as big as an adult. Is it that weird that uh, kids didn't really gravitate towards this one? But like I said, the other Laika films all starred uh, children or teens or something, and those all did, you know, reasonably well, you know? So, Strange World's protagonist is, like, 41, because he has, like, a, an, a nearly adult teenage son, and the dad takes a lot of the limelight away from him. Um, so, there's no kid protagonist, and there's not really a compelling villain in this movie, either. And there are no songs in this movie. This movie is not a musical. I think a Disney movie can have no child protagonist, no music, or no strong villain. But I think missing all three means that the table just has one leg now, and it's not going to work. So is there really any surprise that this just did not do anything, even with its plump Thanksgiving release window? Look, this movie sucks ass. And actually, weirdly, you're not going to hear me say this very often, but I think this movie would have been better if Mark Wahlberg just played Nathan, rather than having him play a younger version of Sully. Because... Mark Wahlberg sort of has that kind of personality that Nathan has. And Nathan isn't necessarily a spring chick, and he's in his 30s or 40s into the game. I think by the end, maybe he's like 50. Mark Wahlberg's like 50, but he looks younger than he is because, you know, actors. So I think he could have easily just played Nathan Drake himself. But they want to have Tom Holland in it for this whole thing. And, like, he's good with all the physical stuff, but, like, it's just like, this just doesn't work. And this movie also has the most pointless end credit scenes because, like, okay, here's a character. Maybe he's a character in the game. I don't know. And then they escape from the situation, and then something stops. They're like, oh, dang. And it's a cut to black without even seeing what it is. 
So I'm like, maybe they haven't cast that part yet. But it's apparently so important to get this one guy to play this this eye patch dude that they credit uh, Pilo Asbake, or however you pronounce his name, in the credits before the scene happens. Like, hey, when was he in the movie? Oh, there he is. We're going to talk about Game of Thrones stuff a little later on in the list. So, but I was nice to this movie because there's a certain cameo that they put in this movie that they didn't have to do. Uh, nobody would have resented them if they didn't do this, but they did it, and I was like, you know what movie? You get a gold star for this one decision. You get complete immunity from the worst list for this one. I don't know if it would have made the bottom list anyway, but that one move kept it completely off the worst list. Uh, so what was the point of this movie? What were you going for? What was the message? What was the purpose of any of this? Why? Why? I mean, I do think at the end of the day, people should probably give this movie a watch, because I guess why not? As far as, like, if there's ever a horror movie that I even like, I'm kind of like, yeah, cool, you know? As opposed to some slasher movies or whatever, which I really have no taste for. Um, but this one, I kind of didn't get what the message was. Like, I didn't get what the encrypted message might have been in Nope, other than just it was like, hey, here's a cowboy story with African Americans. Like, that's cool, fine. But as far as, like, you know, like, get out being about white people and allegedly, I guess, us being about black people, uh, I don't know what the third one is about as far as that goes, but maybe there isn't a clear metaphor this time. It's just like, well, I want to make a movie about whatever I want. It's like, all right, cool. I get it. So in that case, maybe Men is more encrypted than his previous movie, Annihilation. But this movie is better than that one, because Annihilation sucks. And now, the worst list. Number 10, 3,000 Years of Longing. All right, here's some inside baseball for you guys watching, if you don't know. August is where oddball movies sort of come out. Um, sometimes it's like a foreign cartoon that's been dubbed into English that's getting released at that time. I think Un Gaia Kun Muchos Huevos was one of them. Or things like um, the English version of Leap, which was really called Ballerina, but apparently can't call it Ballerina for obvious reasons. Or that foosball movie they made about the foosball players playing real football. Uh, that never actually came out to theaters as far as I'm aware. I think that was meant to come out in August, but never did. If it's early August, it can be a holdover from like the big summer season for something that's just a little weirder than the average fair. Um, like Guardians of the Galaxy was like August 1st. But when you get past that, it's mostly junk. It's like a mini January at the end of the summer when everyone's has seen movies, they've got their fill, and they just throw stuff that they know no one's going to bother seeing. When you get to September, sometimes the movies turn into, like, movies that were going to try to get Oscars, but they just sort of knew weren't ever going to get an Oscar, so they just sort of dump it in ahead of the actual Oscar schedule in the fall. The stuff you see in September is a lot less weird than stuff in August. So yeah, late August, not a great time to be releasing your movie. On August 26, 2022, three bad movies came out. 3,000 Years of Longing, Breaking, and another movie that I'll talk about higher up on the list. Maybe 3,000 Years isn't actually technically worse than Breaking, but that one is just so sort of small, and Boyega's performance in it is really good, so and certainly more compelling than anything we see in this movie. Don't get me wrong, Breaking still sucks, but for reasons that we won't even get to, because again, it's not on the list. Remember that mad lad who made Mad Max Fury Road? That movie with a very simple story, but balls to the other balls action? He's got a new movie coming out, but there's no action, and there's a lot of two people just sort of sitting and telling their stories in a hotel room. Yeah, there are these elaborate um, story sequences that are sumptuously filmed, all from the perspective of our long-lived protagonist, but the stories they're telling just aren't the kind that would have been told for centuries. They're kind of lightweight and airy. I swear the story in Fury Road feels better and more compelling because it's got stakes. This is just the misconnections of a djinn. There's an embarrassing stretch of the movie where a plot arc turns on, I swear this is true, fat girl, fall down and break floor. It's just so distasteful. I'm not saying it had to be an action movie, but this movie just reeks of vanity. It was thrown into the dog days of August because the studio clearly just didn't know what the hell to do with it when they knew it wouldn't bring any awards and it wouldn't put any butts in the seats. Number 9. The Lost City So evidently, Brad Pitt and Sandra Bullock traded each other cameos for two projects they were working on at the same time. 
Uh, Pitt got a lot more of Bullock to appear in Bullet Train, a movie I didn't really like, um, but her presence does sort of help a little bit. But Brad Pitt comes in and nearly saves Lost City and certainly keeps it from a worse spot on this list. The premise is that a romance author and her cover model are both trapped in this allegedly romantic tropical location by a rich lunatic. They are almost saved by the alarmingly competent Brad Pitt. But once he exits the movie, the rest of this movie just does not live up to that idea. And it is a good idea. Don't let anyone tell you it's not. I don't want to hear anyone say this is not a great idea for a romantic comedy. And a damn good cast besides. But once Brad Pitt is gone, this movie just does not try and just slowly marks out its time until it just comes to a stop. This movie didn't have to be this bad and try this little. Without this cameo, this really would have had nothing going for it. It would probably be worse than those cookie-cutter hallmark romantic comedies you see on TV. Number 8. Fantastic Beasts. The Secrets of Dumbledore. We're going to leave all the political stuff with Rowling off to the side for right now, because for the most part, I don't put things on the worst list because I hate someone's politics. Unless it's about someone being dishonest or deceitful. I've left things off the best list for out-of-movie behavior. Maybe I shouldn't. I don't know. I'm also not here to talk about how recasting Grindelwald was bad. Uh, I like Depp as Grindelwald because he doesn't normally play villains. And Mads, you know, usually does. I also started to get a bit uncomfortable with how the hate for, you know, Depp's ex started hitting the mainstream, getting, getting completely out of control. Well, whether she deserved some of it or not, she almost certainly didn't deserve all of it, but whatever, I'm not getting into that crap. I was really, really hoping that the conflict between Grindelwald and Dumbledore was not based on the fact that they were previously lovers, but I can deal with that too. But what I can't deal with is the fact that nothing happens in this movie. I stuck up for the first movie. I stuck up for the second movie, and most people hated that one. But the third entry, we basically get Harry Potter 5 again, but without a Dolores Umbridge to scare the crap out of everybody. It's about fixing an election in the most complicated way possible, including like an animal, because you got to have, um, what's his face? The uh, Newt's commander have something to do, I guess. you got to involve a fantastic beast in this somewhere, so that way the FCC doesn't come down to you for having a misleading title, but whatever. And I don't know why we're talking about, like, fixing an election this late in the game. You know, post-2020, unless it's meant to be more about Boris Johnson instead of Trump, it's just embarrassing and tedious. Maybe she thought she'd get more time to build up to the Wizarding War. But now that this ride seems to be over, with her ever-dwindling popularity, none of this was worth bothering with. One more trilogy with a terrible ending. Number 7. Minions Rise of Gru I enjoyed the Minions spin-off, on and off. And I loved watching the Minions as this giant cloud of chaos and gibberish. And I liked the Minions as individuals, when they were jabbering at things they barely understand, like little space aliens. But with Groot back in charge as a little boy, we get to see him use the Minions to do mischief, like eating ice cream in front of people who are trying to exercise. Okay. I think Gru as a bald and spiteful lonely man is better than the spiteful boy whose school experience isn't even that different from anyone else's. So why is he so grumpy? It's not like he's a little bald boy, he's got all his hair for now. If he got mocked for his intelligence or something, maybe that's something we could relate to. But as it is, he's just annoying. There's a set of villains who he wants to team up with that have a mystical artifact. So apparently magic is now the thing moving this instead of mad science. And this magic changes them into the animals of the Chinese Zodiac. And Michelle Yeoh plays an ancillary character teaching the Minions martial arts. But that's probably the best part of the movie because, once again, we take a couple of the Minions aside and they get to have a little bit of fun while the main villains and Gru are both out of the picture for a brief period of time. Surely the inclusion of the Chinese mysticism and magic and the Zodiac and a Chinese cast member, surely this isn't just to sell the movie in China, could it be? The fact is, putting a mini Gru back into this thing without his daughters, even as a kid, is just not as interesting anymore. Now, I like young Nefario coming back, but Nefario's always been my favorite character. My favorite movie in all the movies is when he has the anti-gravity spray, and the poor minion floats up into the air, out of a window, and up into the sky, and just looks up and says, I'm about to close that. Favorite part of any of the movies. 
Instead, apparently little young Gru doesn't need Nefario to invent m machines for him. He's got a little gun that he attaches cheese with to and sprays it on people. And before he inflicts somebody by being covered in cheese, the man says, Don't cheese me, bro! Oh, ho, ho, ho. remember that incident where a standing senator was asked if he was in skull and bone by a lunatic? And then that poor lunatic experienced police brutality? Oh, ho, 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 ho. what a jeep! I know this film sat in the shelf for a little while during the pandemic, but it didn't sit in the shelf since 2008. The credits of the movie also have the worst version of Funky Town ever recorded. And I'm including that one from Futurama that was sung by Morbo. Number six, Blacklight. There were two Liam Neeson action pictures that made it to theaters this year. Memory wasn't really great, and it had some really dodgy dubbing. It was like watching The Snowman again. But that was directed by Martin Campbell, so we at least can make it a little bit interesting. At least that one had the nerve to be R-rated. Blacklight isn't made with nearly that much care or skill, and that strands poor Neeson in a movie that can't even cover for his advancing age. This is the most, um... And I hate to say this, this is the most Segalian of his movies have been to date. The story is about him as a government agent who rescues people in his inconspicuous luxury sports car with the power of CGI explosions, all because a bunch of rednecks do not know the word surround. It's partially about his strange relationship with his daughter and granddaughter, whom he bought a sun gun for her birthday. She's like, five? Some of this is surely meant to be funny. And of course, his old boss is up to something because of course he is blah blah. Look, I did this whole thing in the 2019 video. I'm not doing it again. The movie opens with a stand-in for AOC that is somehow even more caricaturous than you could imagine by hearing that. But she gets run down after leaving a ride chair by one of the two conspiracy dudes. And you think there might be some way to track this rather than just being thought of as some sort of tragic hit and run. And apparently one of those guys who was trying to follow her gets inspired by her words and goes rogue which I think that part might actually be the sillier part of this whole thing. Look, nobody else saw this picture, but there was a melancholy movie that was partially action movie called Poker Face. It was a movie that sailed into pre-production and was mostly saved by Crow doing a rewrite on it. And he used this as a way to reconcile the grief he was experiencing after losing his father. And look, that movie is not making either list, but that movie is better than this for one reason, is the fact that at least you could tell that Russell Crowe was putting something into this. You know, as weird as it was, and as much as that movie like doesn't really work, especially with Liam Hemsworth like dolled up in old dude makeup because he had to be a peer of Russell Crowe for the movie to make any sense. So and I think he was already tied on to be in there somewhere. So like Liam Hemsworth has his old man makeup on and looks preposterous. But the fact of the matter is one of these things was just like, well, we've got all this money we put in this movie. We gotta make something. And the people in this one were trying. They were trying something kind of silly and odd and maudlin, but you know, the the emotions they were using were were real. So I don't wanna rip on that movie at all. Well Blacklight doesn't really come across as anything um that sincere in that way. It's just a we gotta put Liam Neeson in a movie, chase this, do this, do this whole thing, you know, we, this whole song dance done a, a lot at this point. And this movie is basically a much worse version of The Equalizer with Denzel. Black Knight is not as bad as Taken 3 or Cold Pursuit, the other two times Neeson has made it onto the worst list. I'm sorry, Mr. Neeson, I don't mean to keep putting you on here, but it's just the way the movies turn out. I swear it's not personal. Go ahead and make Taken 4 for all I care. Then the 4 can be the A. Number 5, Easter Sunday. There was a bit of a fight for this spot between this and Mac and Rita which is a terrible and obnoxious comedy from Diane Keaton. Now, it was nice to see Diane Keaton again, but that movie is just so bad and awkward and cartoonish. I'm glad she's willing to do, like, broad slapstick at her age, and she's not worried about looking silly. And there is something to be said about how well she can slip into the embodiment of a bimbo-ish, 30-ish woman. Diane Keaton really does deserve better. And sure, Easter Sunday is meant to exist in, like, a parallel universe comedy movie world, not the real world. So I don't want to kick the first Filipino-American comedy that's ever been made, but this movie is just so obnoxious. I guess it might be a parallel to like the Tyler Perry movies, which I've never seen, but their reputation is to have rather broad humor. But almost every character in this movie is an obnoxious jerk. Maybe this thing just sort of comes across funnier as stand-up. But there is one point where the main character does stand-up at his church, and it's kind of just okay. It probably is one of the better parts of the movie, but you're just like, well, we're definitely not in the real world, are we? 
because I don't think they let you get to do this. The question I always ask about a movie like this is, which one of these two would I rather not sit through again? I don't think I'd enjoy watching Mac and Rita again, but it's a little less obnoxious and I like Diane Keaton a little more, so eats the sun to get to the edge on this one. Number four, Lyle Lyle Crocodile. <sighs> Peter Rabbit has a lot to answer for. How many bad kids movies based on 70 year old kids books are we gonna get? The music in this movie, well obviously there's gonna be a musical because it's about a little crocodile who can't talk but can communicate by singing. And it didn't make sense back then, and it doesn't make sense with Pokemon do it either, so there. When I was in school for theater, there was a girl who had trouble uh, projecting when acting, but could sing her butt off. So there was a big thing that'd be like, okay, sing to get it out, and she would sing a line, and then go back right to all closed up, and it was really quite a thing. So I kind of get the notion of, of opening up when you sing, but like not being able to talk at all, I'm kind of like, all right, you know... So the music of the movie isn't really bad, but, you know, the fact of the matter is this movie does not work in a live-action setting. Making Lyle realistic makes him creepy. His glassy eyes don't invoke sympathy, and his gigantic cr crock jaw lip-syncing these songs with no lips is just awkward. This is just another one of these movies that feels like it could have tumbled out of the 90s. Imagine how bad the CGI would have been if they tried making it back then. Here, Lyle is just realistic enough to be completely off-putting. Just call him Uncanny Frankie Valley. There's also this neighbor character played by Brett Gellman, I think his name is, who is just too viciously mean to Lyle and his family. He's not like the David Allen Greer in the Clifford movie, who was a crap but grew to love Clifford. This guy is just... I mean, he's called like Dr. Grumpo or something, so he's just nasty and grumpy, but just much too far for a movie this lightweight. I'm comparing this to Clifford and saying Clifford is pretty good. And it's like, Clifford is not good. Clifford stinks, but like it didn't make the list that year. Jeez. They have a song called Rip Up the Recipe, but they're baking a cake. Uh, don't rip up a baking recipe. Your pop-ups will not rise. Like these recipes are very well calibrated for pH levels and moisture loss and baking time and all this stuff. Don't do that. Don't experiment with baking. You don't know what you're gonna get. Boop, Life boop, can't be sweet boop, boop, when you disregard boop, the recipe. Boop, 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 a little bit boop, of this, boop, a little boop, bit of that. Boop, it's boop, fulminated mercury. Boop, boop, boop. No! Number three, The Invitation. Here we go. The third movie that came out on August 26th and the second one to make the worst list. This is, I think, the second time I've had two movies from the same day make a worst list. And the last one was last year in 2021 with Adam's Family and Venom. Both came out, I think, on October 1st, I think it was. A young woman uncovers her distant British ancestry, so she goes out to the estate to meet the family. But things are clearly a bit weird. And what could possibly be going on here? Ah, oh, ah. Oh. Look, there are a few other movies that didn't quite make the list that are part of this genre, this post-get-out world. People want to make movies that are like, what is going on here, movies? Where you wonder, what's this explanation for this weird situation that we have going on here? Not that this is brand new with a Get Out invented it, but after that one took off, everyone wants to seem to do it. Including one movie that I, I basically liked for the most part, despite certain things that I won't name, because saying that's going to be part of this sort of movie would be a spoiler. I'm going to show the poster over here. I won't say the name. Look away. Three, two, one. Okay, take it away. But here, the what in the what's going on here is so damn obvious. I really expected it to be some sort of anti-twist. would turn out to be... Everything had like an innocent, or at least an alternative, explanation. It would help if everyone wasn't such a giant poop head in this movie, which a lot of movies in this kind of genre turn into. What genre? It would be a spoiler if I said! Towards the end, when the heroine knows the predicament that she's ensnared in, there's part of me where I think she could just... join them? To not really that much detriment to herself? If she'd actually just gone along with the bad guys and just accepted their wealth and power in these things, I thought that would have been absolutely hilarious. Our heroine, Natalie Emmanuel, plays Ramsay in Fast 7 and Onward, the British hacker character. Even in those stupid movies, she's effortlessly charming and beautiful. Here, she's standoffish and airheaded, only not quite as bad as all the British snobs that surround her. Bringing her into this and straddling her with an American accent and a lame personality is just criminal. 
If you're wondering why Morbius didn't make the list this year, it's not the worst movie of its bloodline this year. Number two, Brian and Charles. This will be almost certainly the furthest out I've been from the consensus of a film in years. Brian and Charles is about a Welsh inventor named Brian who makes an automaton named Charles. The automaton is clearly just a dude in a box. It's not made clear how he's given his creation life, that's just not important. Quickly, the automaton becomes a metaphor for parenthood, especially if being a parent of a teenager, because movies can't get enough of that for some reason, but that's not the problem. The problem is, it's meant to be a mockumentary, but it makes no sense. In the short film that this was based on, which actually is fine, the short film is fine as a 12 minute diversion. Uh, it's on YouTube, you can check it out. But, you know, in that, the documentary crew comes in after Charles was created to document this new discovery. In the movie, they're making the documentary because he's an inventor of absolutely useless and purposeless nonsense like a purse covered in pine cones, something nobody needs and nobody could ever make unless you were just trying to be noticed. If this was meant to be a metaphor for isolation and using Dada as art as a means to try to connect with someone, anyone out there, maybe even the unseen documentary filmmakers, maybe. This isn't an insurmountable flaw. You just explain the cameraman as a friend or something. I don't think that they do. So Brian is documented living his purposeless life in his quiet village in rural Wales where he has the town girl who secretly likes him, which every movie like this has to have because they can't have a guy just be undateable, right? There always has to be a place to put your wee-wee. If they had Brian and Charles end this movie by becoming homosexuals together, I would have left it off the list. But there's also a grown-up bully who treats Brian the way he probably always did, and his daughters fancy the ugly pinecone purse for unknown reasons, so his life is basically a high school interaction, and even that would not necessarily be a problem. The problem is, whenever he interacts with another character in this movie, they just sort of talk to him as if there's not a camera following him. They have candid conversations, the bully character like shoves him or something, and seems not to take any notice about the camera crew. You might expect a bully to clean up his act, or possibly provoke something deliberately in front of the camera, but that might get him talked to by the police. Anything to remind us that, yeah, the cameraman is a real guy, really in this world, would have been nice. He hides behind something and they subtitle a conversation recorded from a distance with very hard to hear dialogue. Uh, the bully acting fake nice when he realizes he's being observed, but is different when he thinks the cameras are off. A glance at the camera that someone else doesn't quite notice. Anything. This is just one of the pitfalls that a mockumentary of the best list has artfully dodged. Uh, the documentary there starts with a unique element having just been discovered, and their life changes as the internet starts to learn about them. The robot doesn't mean anything like that to Brian, other than it being his property and a visible icon of the world bending to his will. This isn't a mockumentary to talk about invention or fatherhood, or even that 21st century motivation to record everything. It's a mockumentary because they're somewhat easier to make. And the dimwits who made this film just did not care that what they made made no sense. This is vanity equal to that of 3,000 years, if not more. It's smug about how shallow ideas and his man in the cardboard box. Look at us. How droll. Gag me with two spoons. And number one, Moonfall. Of course, the worst movie would have to be something truly odious. Something that feels like a movie from the past, with all the dust and problematic stuff that that would entail. A movie with a wacky conspiracy theorist who turns out is correct, despite the fact that we now know that conspiracy theorists are dangerous jerks who need medical intervention and not to be the protagonist of any story, not even their own. A story about how your wife was wrong to leave you for the richer guy because you're such a Fonzie and your semen is so strong and your bike is cool and not embarrassing and you don't get why your son doesn't understand how cool you are. A story about how disasters happen to other people and a story about how Elon and China are the good guys. There's a story where they're like, use an EMP, not a nuke, when a nuke creates an EMP. I know Roland Emmerich has done this before, and with more success. I didn't even hate Independence Day 2, but this is just unacceptable as entertainment. Who wants a disaster movie right now? Who wants this one? John Bradley was in two movies at the same time, with Marry Me coming out a week later. This is something I've been ruminating on for a while, but I am formally announcing my theorem of Game of Thrones cinematic exacerbation. Unless the person was in movies before Game of Thrones, like Peter Dinklage, with Sean Bean. Every movie that has been done by a former member of the Game of Thrones cast is no good. 
It just has not translated into any good movies. We can throw Matt Smith's movies on there now, too, because he's now part of the cast with House of Dragon, so sure, why not? And now, the best list. Number 10, Jackass Forever. Do you like Jackass? At this point, you must know the answer to that question, right? You know what you're signing up for. Men who are now in their 40s to early 50s doing the same stupid stuff with some new blood to help bring this into a new direction. Some of them who were probably kids when all this folder all started in 2000. I don't watch a lot of dumb stuff like this, but on the other hand, what is all of YouTube except people making asses of themselves? NCCP Grey. So yeah, after everything we went through, seeing this in February 2022 was legitimately the hardest I had laughed since all this stuff started. I needed it so bad. They even made this partially before the, you know, that whole thing had sort of completely gotten under control. So even they saw the value in taking a risk to help bring humor back to the people. Among the new participants, most notable is Rachel Wolfson, a woman and I believe a comedian who's done some alarmingly painful stunts through the course of this movie, like it was nothing. There's one stunt where she does this thing, I won't say what, although it's on one of the posters if you really want to know, and I was just sitting there thinking, like, she's so tough and badass, I'm in love. Yeah, I shouldn't say that. Cut this part out. Definitely don't leave this in. She probably gets weirdos talking about that all the time. I need to make absolutely certain I don't leave this in, okay? And don't forget to take this out because you did this joke last year in 2021 about Jenna Frooms, okay? So don't use this footage, okay? Make certain you don't use this footage. Pay attention when you're reviewing this before you put it on YouTube. And if you hear me say this, redo it and take it out, okay? Don't leave this in, okay? It would be very embarrassing f to have me talking about, you know, how, uh, tough and bad as I think the 30-year-old uh, comedian is. So, yeah, leave this out. Don't leave it in. Okay, I should notice that in the edit. Alrighty. And uh, now that that's all done with, it's time to practice the trombone and make references to BoJack Horseman, a show that I do not watch. Number nine, Beast. It just Elba plays a man who takes his family out to Africa and quickly finds himself beset by a ferocious lion. A lean, 93-minute movie that is exactly what it needs to be and puts our heroes through just what they need to. This movie isn't quite non-stop action, but it's just enough life or death struggle to keep you tied up in knots. Yeah, the lion doesn't really act like a normal lion. He just shrugs off some tranquilizer darts, which... Not how that works. The lion is basically Jason Voorhees. I think the only explanation is that this lion is angry because he survived an attack by poachers. One more variety of man that we can add to the list of movie characters we never sympathize with. Yes, I'm normally one of those people who dislikes when movies mischaracterize the way that a wild animal behaves. Because misinformation like this can lead to people either acting stupid and ending their own lives, or doing something and hurting a real wild animal. I hate crocodile movies because sometimes they have it that the crocodile will chase people. And the funny thing about it, that is crocs don't chase anything. They're ambush predators. They're cold-blooded. They can't afford to be running around and using up all this energy chasing you if they don't know that they can catch you. So they just hang around a riverbed or whatever and wait for something to come by. If they know they can get you, they will get you. So don't mess with crocs. Don't mess with stingrays either. But a mammal? Based on the mammals I've known, yeah, I can believe that a mammal will find the energy to seek revenge. Number eight, Watcher. Look, there were a lot of movies that I hated that I wanted to put in the bottom 10 list. Batman would have been a good choice, just for not being a very interesting version of Batman, and trying to have its cake and eat it too, on certain choices for the villain. But whatever. Another movie I hated was Smile, which I'm just going to spoil because I don't care. So this is sort of spooky entity of unknown origin, which follows people around until it finally gets to possess them. In which case it will find someone else, kill themselves in an extravagant and traumatizing fashion, so that way they can then follow the next person on the line, and continue on like this. Uh, forever, basically. For a while we wonder if the victim is actually just crazy and none of this is real, but she also makes some dumb decisions and she fails to communicate clearly what's happening to her to the people around her. The dialogue is torturing itself to get into a mode where she can be misunderstood just so. And that's a really annoying thing about this. She doesn't just go out and say, look, I believe I'm being followed by some sort of supernatural entity, whatever. And yeah, maybe that's energy to the funny farm, but she's always like, 
getting distracted about other things, talking about things that don't matter. But of course, this is one of these um, movie things that can change what you see so that she has hallucinations and dreams that aren't dreams and other stuff. Now, for anyone who knows about another possession movie where there's a monster moving from person to person and they establish that in the possession of this family is an old dilapidated house, we know where this could go. If the main character, a psychologist, had refused to simply kill herself with nobody around because then nobody would be traumatized by it and maybe the entity would dissipate. But if she refused to do this on the grounds that the patients that he, she had helped across her career would then see that she had killed herself and then all the times she surely had tried to talk somebody out of doing this meant nothing and that their lives would be in jeopardy too. If they had talked about this in the movie, I would have given this movie so much more credit. But no, no matter how competently this movie is made, it's basically a 100 minute roller coaster with no bumps that just goes straight forward that you cannot get off of. There is no escape, there is no helping or anything. It's just a movie to watch a woman in utter misery. It's basically just the Bye Bye Man 2, and if you like this sort of garbage, then I look down on you. So why don't I reward a movie that did this right? Watcher is about a woman coming to a foreign country where she doesn't speak the native language. Her isolation makes her start to feel like she's being targeted, and she swears that someone is watching her. But how can she satisfy her nerves, her curiosity, without coming off like some sort of weirdo stalker herself? Who can she really confide in? Has she just watched too much true crime TV? Thank you, Watcher, for playing fair. There's some other random movie called Watcher, a TV show called Watcher. It's kind of like how they have a new show called Poker Face, and I'm like, usually when things have the same title, they don't come out like the next year. Maybe they're running out of titles, I don't know. Number seven, Belle. When's the last time anime made by Best List? Bell is about the seemingly likely future where everything is online and in VR. A world called You. But it sure looks a lot better than the metaverse. A plain young woman finally joins in and somehow becomes a singing superstar in the virtual world. But that world is threatened when a horrendous beast comes in and attacks people and ruins all the fun. What sort of man lurks behind the beastly troll facade? We might already have an idea of what might be behind it. Uh, but this PG anime movie for teenagers deals with some rather adult themes in a way that is stark and shocking. Leave it to some other country that isn't America to make a cartoon with greater emotional depth than some R-rated pictures I saw this year. Number six, Marcel, the shell with shoes on. Sometimes a lot of effort goes into a movie that just does not turn out any good. I mean, all movies are a lot of work, but animation, puppetry, stop motion, that stuff's a ton of work. This movie was evidently the effort of several years of development for Jenny Slate and Dean Fleischer Camp. It's about a disused property that becomes an Airbnb, only for a recently divorced man to discover Marcel, eking out a meager living in a world so much bigger than him. Marcel is optimistic and unassuming and just so cute. This is a movie about an innocent person being discovered by the internet and it going a lot better than most of the times that happened in real life. I'm a little surprised I get away with some of the jokes in a PG movie, but they're harmless. Marcel did get nominated for Best Animated Picture, which is a little weird because I think it has much more live action segments than the Lego movie did, and that's one of the reason that didn't get nominated, I do believe. Uh, and that's still a bunch of crap, but whatever, I'm still bitter about that. I mean, depending on what else has gotten nominated, I'm not really certain what else was nominated this time. Marcel could win. I, I think we should stick up for the little guy. Number five. Hustle. Adam Sandler plays a recruiter for the NBA who gets pushed out of his team, but he finds a promising new player in Spain whom he takes under his wing and tries to get him to get into the NBA. A story of a man left slightly jaded by the system pressing him out and rediscovering his love of the game. Hustle is the best basketball movie since the last one that Adam Sandler made. Number four, The Bad Guys. So Puss in Boots made use of a new style of animation to give some of his action scenes a little bit more pep. Don't get me wrong, Puss in Boots 2 is great. Uh, it would have made the list in a different year, and it's fun to see this revival from like 11 years on go so well. But as far as DreamWorks animated movies go, the bad guy steals it right away from them, right from under their nose. Partially a heist movie, partially a movie about that thing that all kids love, misbehaving. Maybe that's why the Disney pictures didn't really appeal this year. The lack of a really good bad guy. 
Sure, the antics of the bad guy sometimes involve flatulence jokes, but never without support, never just for no reason. I think we call this the G-Force theorem. But the 3D work that invokes the hand-drawn animation with enormous amounts of frenetic movement from the characters, this is a damn good kids film. Number three, Top Gun Maverick. This sat on the shelf for two years, I'm pretty sure complete, during the pandemic, waiting for the right time to release it. And yeah, some people find Cruise to be a controversial figure, sometimes I even do, but nevertheless, this movie is excellent. It's crazy action and pushing the sound barrier and your own limits. It's that old plane that still has some pep in it so we can stop our incredibly non-specific enemies from wielding the nuclear power that we enjoy. I feel like I'm not selling this very well. Not that I have to based on how many tickets it sold. But saying Top Gun 2 is exciting is like saying that Dr. Pepper has an unusual taste. It's like, no duh, that's what it's there for. And even so, somehow Top Gun 2 had the most emotionally charged scene in an action film this year. If you know, then you know. And if you don't know, it might not mean anything to you. To hell with anyone who says that action movies can't be emotional. Action movies only work if you are invested in what's happening. Otherwise, it's just noise. Yeah, I could give it to The Woman King, which is damn good in its own right, don't get me wrong. But the story started to go in a way I kind of didn't like. Um, it probably won't bother you, but I was like, eh, I don't really dig this. Um, and it's not all just kill whitey. Uh, and even if it was, what? Like, only white people could have power fantasies? What's the big deal? Check out The Woman King. Like, of all the movies I saw this year that didn't make the top ten, that's the one I recommend. Go ahead and see The Woman King, because you probably already saw Top Gun. Number two. The Outfit. Mark Rylance plays a mild-mannered English suit maker named Leonard, whose shop is used as a drop for 50s Chicago gangsters that surround his business. Of course, they love him because he makes them look good. But something goes wrong one night and he's thrown into the dark and tumultuous world of organized crime. Leonard is a patient and resourceful man. How could he not be? To take fabric and slowly, slowly turn it into fashion. Sure, this movie comes across slightly like a play that's been turned into a film. It's a bit claustrophobic and cold, but I feel like that might be intentional. A story like this could take place in a million different locations, but for Leonard, it's just the same four walls that are allegedly his, but that he is forced to share with rats. What do you do? Either get rid of the rats, or get rid of the walls. And number one, The Menu. This movie deserves a much more thoughtful breakdown. If you'll excuse me. The Menu is about a reclusive chef who makes intense deconstructions of meals for some very wealthy diners at an exclusive event on a secluded island. But the movie itself is very deliberately crafted in the same way. A simple diner might complain that the characters on show here are oversimplified and bitter. It is itself a metaphor for the bitter reductions and tiny baubles of intense flavor that the chef himself serves to his obnoxious, unappreciative customers. Each course is so saturated with meaning that the chef has to stand there and explain the meaning himself. Our chef is clearly the master of the culinary arts, as the writers are the master of the storytelling arts, plating and arranging their ingredients just so, no matter how silly it might seem to the wannabe critics and the real critics out there. Even they fail to recognize the skill at what has been done here. Every line is important as they give us only the details we need to know to understand why our chef has chosen these ingredients for his masterpiece. And thus, each of the diners represents the dishes themselves, reduced so far down that we only just get enough to know their stories and why their stories are meant to revolt us. Sure, a crouton dipped in cilantro oil would taste like soil and toothpaste, but that does not mean it is soil and toothpaste. Maybe some of the croutons belong in the plate, maybe some of them really don't, but that's up to us to decide which of the magnified flavors that we find acceptable. The chef knows his ingredients and knows just what to do with them. Perhaps a diner experiences a loss of body that is just as metaphorical as it is physical. He himself has stripped himself of the golden adornment and the symbology that it represents by his own sins. The diners are not as random as it might seem, and they're all targeted for their particular transgressions against the chef. Some of these are coded into the food itself, sometimes literally printed onto the food like a photograph. I'm not as familiar with classic cuisine, but I guess they can really do that nowadays. I mean, if you asked me 20 years ago what sous vide was, I'd say, wasn't that a Spider-Man villain? 
Now I'm pretty sure you can get a mix of weed. The food critics sneer at the presentation given to them. They see something they can't explain, something that seems like a mistake. But of course, they should have trusted that the chef did all this on purpose. If the chef brings out a piece of toast that was burned to a cinder, one must look at the totality of the meal and what flavors pair best with carbon. But the chef's greatest contempt is not saved for his enemies, but those who'd call themselves fans without even the faintest idea of what goes into this labor. The pseudo-intellectuals that saturate the internet, but are experts in nothing. What would they do if they faced the immense pressure the chef endured for even a minute? Turn into diamond or crush like talc? All of this leads to the final course, where one unusual interloper stands out among the rest and refuses to play along with the chef's intricate games any longer. She wants something ordinary, pedestrian, familiar, and filling. These things sell themselves because they are effective and delicious, and the chef has derelicted himself behind technology and technique. She appeals to him to just give us, the audience, what we've been craving ever since we sat down. No more salmon foams and baubles of bitter sun choke reduction. Just give us something good. But this is child's play compared to the parlay that this familiar act leads to another intensely familiar dining experience. There is something that most people do when dining out. But then there is one dining act that almost nobody ever does, certainly in America. Skipping dessert. But then when dessert is served, um, the chef mocks s'mores as being disgusting. Which I don't understand because s'mores are delicious. Look, there's some s'mores ice cream that you can get at the gas station near my house. And I'm like, yeah, sure, ate the whole thing. You might not believe me when I say this, but I don't normally eat an entire pint of ice cream. But, you, you know, I guess I'm driving up hill to make you believe that. But anyway, and look, I know the, the modern graham cracker is, is pretty lame and pretty much only gets brought out to make s'mores or to make graham cracker crusts, I guess. Um, and the marshmallow pales in comparison to its homemade counterpart, but so does everything in American cuisine. Is that... His beef, it seems not to be his problem with this, but he just thinks that s'mores are gross. Like what? Like, you're going to complain about peanut butter and chocolate next? Is it just that a basic but satisfying thing, it just isn't good enough for you anymore? Like someone who seeks out ever more exotic varieties of pornography? Like, what is the purpose of this whole thing except to have something hot and fiery to end the show with? What the hell is going on here? <sighs> <clears throat> You know what? <clears throat> I really do think the denouement of this movie is absolutely fantastic, but it's not worth the stomach-nodding boredom, the bitterness, and the absolutely smothering arrogance of this movie that we are forced to go through to get to it. Normally, a movie with a scene like this gets off with a warning. Not this time. Screw it. Where was Blacklight on the list? I think it was number six. Look, I went and rewatched that, and look, that movie sucks. Don't get me wrong. But I have no long-lasting rancor for the movie. It's just not well made. It's just perfectly slotted to be thrown away in January and to be completely forgotten about in two months. It's not toxic like London Has Fallen or Taken Three were. And by and large, I probably actually liked Smile less than this. But that's definitely well made. It's really hard to look at this and say that this is anybody operating at their best capacity despite all their highfalutin intentions. So yeah, not only is the menu not the best movie of the year, it's one of the worst. Big twist! I felt this reversal was my best way to cover my feelings on the menu. I had to show that, yeah, I saw what they were doing. I understood what they were going for. I mean, how could I not when it's just so obvious? So yeah, I get what you were going for, and it sucks! I know this is what the chef intended to make, but the chef is an asshole who made something only snobs could possibly get something out of. The filmmakers have evidently made a direct one-to-one -one comparison with ultra-fussy and ultra-fancy cooking. It's produced by people with far too much money who have been making what they make for so long that they've completely lost sight of anything tasteful or fun or even something of ordinary sustenance. You know, if this career path is that painful for you, you can just not do it. Stop trying to find satisfaction in creating ever more microcosmic and allegedly meaningful but entirely indigestible cuisine. Stop inflicting these disgusting perversions on us. Just retire with your staggering wealth and maybe go to therapy. There are people out there who legitimately compared this movie to Pig. That's like telling me you couldn't tell the difference between a dollar bill and a lettuce leaf. 
pig was about how food can engage your humanity, not numb it because you think you're better than all your patrons. And legitimately, maybe you are better than your patrons, but then it behooves you to come through those double doors with something better than this. You call this food? No, the best movie of the year is not such a professional tantrum against critics, but a movie that revels in having fun. A movie that wouldn't give one damn if the critics didn't like it, because it's just for them. A pair who seem to thrive with working within limitations, rather than getting bogged down by their wealth. It's the latest from those two crazy, fun-loving filmmakers, and the most interesting pair to come out of the indie scene in a decade. The Daniels. The best movie of the year is everything. Everywhere all at once. This has been the easiest choice for best of the year in quite a while. Everything Everywhere All at Once is a story about a woman who is trying to file her taxes, but someone contacts her and reveals to her that there are systems that surround her that she knows nothing about, but she might be able to influence. So it's a bit like The Matrix, eh? Except this movie was made even cheaper, yet it still explores ideas of purpose and family and existentialism way better than, say, oh, I don't know, Matrix 4? I went way too easy on Matrix 4 last year, but that movie failed utterly to realize that The Matrix appealed because it was a universal theme executed perfectly, not a theme that only applies to the filmmaker herself, made sloppily and carelessly because they're forcing you to. Like, I think everything to say about Matrix 4, you can say double about Space Jam 2, so, like, it's not getting retroactively put on the worst list. That movie's still much, much worse. Everything Everywhere All at Once was made with enormous love, not just because Warner Brothers wanted to leverage some brand that they'd been sitting on like a goose. It's beautifully performed, with a standout performance of Kei Hui Kwan as the deuteragonist. Even if we are in the worst timeline, as it seems ever likely that we are, the art we make along the way might just make it all worth it. Thank you all for watching. <sighs> I did it. I, I finished all the top tens. I'm, I'm free. So Anna Taylor-Joy's character has been paid to be there by What's-His-Face, Nicholas Holt's character. Wiki calls her an escort, but the article with the word escort on it links to the article for the word prostitution. They're apparently not exactly the same thing. But um, there's someone else in the, in the party that recognizes her, and the tension it provides him makes me think that she is just a sex worker, because I don't think that CEO or whatever the hell he is was paying that kind of dough to just talk. The fact of the matter is that her time has been paid for, you know? So when she's about to make a faux pas, he scolds her viciously, like, you know, way more than necessary. And she says, you need to apologize. No, he doesn't. He's paying for your time. Are you gonna complain about any of the time you don't have to spend stooping this dimwit? Now, she could have said something like, um, we need to talk about our arrangement, or don't do this in front of everybody, we're all here to have fun, or even, you can't treat me like this, or almost anything else would be a better line for her to say there that would make sense with the relationship they're trying to imply, and then the relationship that it turns out is actually there. They could have written this in a way that worked both ways, but they didn't bother. Remember when I said this was well-written? Yeah, that was a lie. Uh, I promise not to do it too much. The very last thing that we see in this movie is her taking the little paper menu that's been printed out that's so trendy nowadays uh, and folding it up and using it to wipe the corner of her mouth. The menu got off easy. I know this joke would have been better if I had burgers instead of a chicken sandwich, but I tried to get burgers earlier today when I was out and about, um, and I just asked for six patties, and they gave me 
six patties, no buns, nothing. As if I was starting like keto or something. I still ate them. I'm like, I'm not letting that go to waste, I guess. But now, so I'm like, all right, doing the DoorDash. I mean, it was nice to be able to bring in the thing with the stickers and be like, hey, stickers. There's a selfie of me at work at one point where I'd gotten something DoorDash to the, to the place. And it says, aren't you glad you stayed in? And I'm sort of like at this uh, deeply <laughs> unhappy look on my face as I'm like, yeah, stayed in, huh? So you like Natalie Emanuel so much and you're so familiar with her work that you did not know that she was in Game of Thrones. Because I don't watch Game of Thrones. What the hell do you want from me? I don't know. You could, like, look her up. You didn't put any of the fast movies on this list. I mean, they could just easily be there as well. That kind of adds to my... Point. Maybe I'll make a full video about this and do like a real scientific thing. You know, I could be watching the Super Bowl right now. Literally. It's the... Yeah, let's adjust that focus ring. Yeah, right there. We're doing this during the Super Bowl. It's the Eagles and the Chiefs. You want to watch it, you do that somewhere else. Nah. Peter Rabbit has a lot to answer for. Answer from is what I wrote down. What the hell? Maybe that was an autocorrect on um, Word or something. I, it's because of the lens in the way. I can't see if I'm actually doing a walk-in. Oh, this suit doesn't fit me anymore. It didn't at the time, I think. I'm going to say that so I don't have to reconcile the fact that I'm getting a whole lot fatter. Doot, 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 doot. It's a Muppet song. Doot, 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 doot. The Muppets are cool. Do, 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 And the Muppets are better than this movie. I think every movie that Muppets have made have made better than this. We're doing a sequel. How hard could it be? We can't get any worse than The Godfather 3. They cut that out of the movie. I can't believe it. I'm not the kids going to get Godfather 3 jokes. Maybe they just want to go easy on a couple of these days. I don't know. We're still going, apparently.